Steve Hoffman represents his union, AFSCME, American Federation of State, County, and M Municipal Employees, AFL-CIO, Local 304, on the Martin Luther King County Labor Council in Seattle, Washington, where he lives. Steve is a shop steward in his workplace, where he is a maintenance electrician. He is a member of the Seattle branch of the Freedom Socialist Party, and he wrote the political resolution on behalf of the FSP National Committee, of which he is a member. So Steve, take it away. Thanks, Emily. Uh, I don't have any baseball wisdom, but uh, that was fun. I liked it. It was very apropos. Friends, uh, clearly capitalism is a broken down, pollution belching <laughs> jalopy of an economic system. <laughs> it has been in trouble since the 1970s, but in 2008, the wheels fell off. Around the world, millions of working people lost their jobs, their homes, and any notion that the next generation will fare better than previous ones. Of course, the jalopy is still good at making the rich even richer. So the bosses are hell-bent on making the workers and the poor pay to fix it up and keep it running. But working folks, especially women and youth, have other ideas. They have tossed out repressive regimes in North Africa and middle, in the Middle East. Often women protesters and textile strikers were leaders in those battles. Young people launched the Occupy movement, which spread like wildfire. In the U.S. and other countries, occupiers exposed the 1% as the criminals who caused the economic meltdown. Dozens of general strikes against austerity were waged across Europe. Here in L.A., immigrant protesters, young immigrant protesters, defiantly chant, undocumented, unafraid, as they take on the Obama administration for its record number of deportations. Haven't we all been thrilled to see workers and youth simply lose their fear and take on the powers that be? Yes. But the capitalists have managed to remain in charge even though they have a political crisis on their hands. We can see their troubles in the tents and more frequent military buildups and maneuvers. And rich nations squeeze indebted poorer nations like Greece so hard they may never recover economically. The U.S. government shut shutdown circus last year, which brought Congress's approval rating down to 9%, is another sign of dysfunction. The growth of fascist movements in Europe shows that some bosses think the usual methods of control are no longer adequate. Things look grim in the madhouse formerly known as bourgeois political stability. Yes. Surely, humanity would have a brighter future if the working class were put in charge. But our class has a problem, too. It is a lack of a revolutionary party that can throw the exploiting bums out. We need an international organization that can draw the lessons of history and current struggles. One that can develop a program that will inspire the whole working class to rise up globally. One that can assemble the determined fighters who can get the job done. Putting off the construction of such a party would be a mistake. The crisis-ridden profit system that grinds down workers only gets nastier. In fact, we see that workers in richer nations are now pitted against those in poorer countries in a direct job-to-job -job -job wage competition. This low-wage capitalism will continue to drive down everyone's wages. The document describes the global scale of poverty. 900 million workers around the world do not earn enough to stay above the cruelly low $2 a day poverty line. <coughs> I mean, who can live anywhere on two bucks a day? Now, a recent report by the National Employment Law Project shows that most job gains in the U.S. during the so-called 
recovery have been low-wage jobs. Really, workers have been getting hard, hit hard for a long time. The profit system has been the thievery that keeps on taking. For instance, since 1968, worker productivity in the U.S. has more than doubled. If the minimum wage had kept pace with that growth, it would be nearly $22 an hour. And how long will the, even the anemic recovery last? As comrade Dennis from Seattle pointed out in his contribution to the Bolt discussion, even powerhouse China is lurching towards an economic meltdown that could drag down the global economy. No, things have to change for real. It will be a tragedy if the global wave of worker rebellions does not manage to get rid of the real problem, capitalism. If that does not happen, the bosses just might unleash enough repression to make sure that we don't get another chance for a long time. Worshiping at the altar of profit is no way to run a world or, for that matter, to take care of a planet. That's obvious here in Southern California. If you're in LA, you could find yourself knee deep in a puddle of crude oil <laughs> caused by a recent high pressure pipeline rupture. If you're in San Diego County, you could be running for your lives from unprecedented wildfires fires caused by drought. We know that severe droughts around the world are caused by the unchecked burning of fossil fuels. Nevertheless, energy corporations are raking in enough bucks that they can keep buying politicians so they can mine and frack their way to climate Armageddon. But no matter how much money they have, they won't be able to buy another planet after they've wrecked this one. Sort of like Dylan told the masters of war, you know, they won't have enough money to buy back their soul. As the document says, capitalism today is a twin-headed monster of economic and ecological crisis. These two crises are completely intertwined by their common cause, the insane pursuit of higher and higher profits. And they each make the other worse. They cannot be resolved separately. Which brings me to eco-socialism. The very term implies that to save ourselves from ecological catastrophe, we must get rid of capitalism and usher in a human and creature-friendly socialism. And only the working class can stop the wheels from turning and provide the leadership necessary to topple the corporate elite. Now, in an eco-socialist future, we could implement an economic plan that would reduce fossil fuel use. That plan could provide jobs for all by putting people to work, changing our energy infrastructure to renewables, and by building a robust, free mass transit system. <clears throat> we could put more folks to work by providing free education and other social services. Yeah. Yeah. We could plant more trees and fo focus more on environmental cleanup. We will have the resources to do it all because we won't be building more yachts and mansions for the super rich <laughs> or waging more wars on other working people. Here, here. Hell, we could completely dismantle and get rid of the Pentagon. Yeah. Yeah. While we're still stuck in a capitalist present, present day, we can make bold demands that would really help the planet in the short term and would point towards a better future. One such demand is to nationalize the energy in industry under workers' control. We need to get the industry out of the hands of the people who profit so much from dirty energy sources. Yeah. They could be put under the democratic control of the workers and of the community and then be run in a far more environmentally friendly way. As Marxists, we in the Freedom of Socialist Party inherit 
an eco-socialist perspective. Karl Marx and Frederick Engels wrote extensively about the unnatural separation capitalism imposes between humans and nature. They expose the devastating consequences of the exploitation of nature for profit. Consequences like depletion of the soil by capitalist agriculture and flooding caused by deforestation. They really were quite ahead of their time on these issues. As socialists, we in the FSP see a natural connection between eco-socialism and feminism. Women suffer the most from the effects around the world, from the effects of global warming, mining, and industrial agriculture. Women are often the traditional growers of food in you know, less developed, poorer countries, and thereby they have unique knowledge of their local ecosystems. But patriarchal traditions frequently prevent them from having a say in how their communities should adjust to climate change. On the other hand, indigenous women, like Nestora Silgano, have been at the forefront of struggles to defend their communities, as well as the land and resources that they depend on for their survival. Throughout Australia, all of the Americas, and elsewhere, these female eco-warriors have fiercely resisted agribusiness and international mining corporations. Women fighting for their rights in the cities have a common oppression with their sisters in the countryside, and they can join together to fight common, common enemies like the mining companies in agribusiness, sweatshop owners, or white right-wing governments. Feminism is a unifying force that lifts up the most downtrodden and thereby everyone else. A feminist eco-socialist movement would leave no one behind. It would transcend the destructive divisions within the working class and mobilize the best fighters def to defend workers and the natural world. Another aspect of FSP's socialist feminist program is a recognition that the le leadership in a class struggle will come from those most discriminated against and most exploited. And they happen to be the most experienced in fighting back because well, that's what they've had to do all their lives. The founders of the Freedom Socialist Party saw that these most oppressed workers, women, people of color, immigrants, LGBT folks, and people with disabilities, are destined to be the tip of the working class's spear. Just look at who is organizing unions, taking on the right wing, and raising hell from poor neighborhoods to legislative chambers. You can see that the FSP's invaluable contribution to Marxist theory, the leadership of the most oppressed, is more relevant today than ever. Okay, people talked about the discussion. In three months prior to this convention, there have been discussions in each of the FSP branches about this, the documents that have been presented for them, and this one was discussed. Uh, quite a bit. And on behalf of the National Committee, I would like to express uh, appreciation for the various comments, suggestions, and ideas that were offered. Comrades proposed changes and pointed out issues that needed to be added to the document or expanded upon. I'll talk about a few of them uh, that came up several uh, times. First, the document needs an analysis of environmental racism. I mean, really, in a country like the U.S., which was built on the foundations of genocide and slavery, race is bound to be a central issue when it comes to how environmental devastation plays out. Comrade Emily, our chair, and also the uh, coordinator of the National Comrades of Color Caucus, she pointed out, and, and she's from New York, and she pointed out in her discussion bulletin that pollution-causing facilities like bus depots, incinerators, and sewage treatment plants are typically located in poor communities of color. She gave some historical background on how people of color have fought for environmental justice, especially in urban centers. The party must be ready to address 
racism as we continue our work in the environmental movement. Also, there was plenty of discussion about the eco-socialism section of the draft resolution. I mean, environmental issues have been extensively covered in our Freedom Socialist newspaper that we published, and comrades have um, been involved in the in the resistance to all the, the many of the environmentally destructive things like uh, nuclear power and coal trains. Um, in the lip table outside, there's uh, this excellent pamphlet uh, that says it was uh, written by Mark. Um, from Seattle and with others, and it's, uh, it was, says to leave coal behind, take profits out of the energy industry, and it's very educational, and it was handed out at a rally against the coal trains in Seattle, and it puts forth excellent demands. I like the one that says build solidarity among workers and the oppressed people in the U.S. and internationally, and um, so, you know, really points out that that the fight for an ecologically sane future is really an international one since the ecological disasters are so global in scale. Um, and then, but you know, elevating <clears throat> the importance of the ecological strike crisis and tying it into an eco-socialist framework is a new emphasis for our party. So many questions came up. For instance, Comrade Steve from Baltimore rightly pointed out that we should consider the environmental consequences of manufacturing and disposal of solar panels before we propose them as the main solution. Then Comrade Peter in Australia weighed in to defend use, use of solar power. So to me, <coughs> the, the many comments pointed out that the party should systematically develop its theory of eco-socialism. We need to know more about political tendencies in the ecology movement, and we should become well-versed in the science behind both the environmental problems and the solutions that are being proposed. So really, this section of the draft resolution was an initial foray into that topic. So we got to get rid of capitalism. How do we go about dumping capitalism? Essentially we have to convince the majority of the working class of two things. That a, revolutionary, uh, that a revolution is needed to improve their lot and secure a decent future. And that it is possible to win that revolution. It sounds simple, but it can be tricky. <laughs> First, we will have to win workers away from reformist leaders in the labor and social movements who most definitely do not agree that a revolution is needed. They claim that they can fix the capitalist jalopy so that it runs to meet the needs of working folks. But we know that no one is that good a mechanic. <laughs> not even Cubans who keep their 55 Chevy running forever. <laughs> now, we appreciate union leaders like those in AFSCME Council 36 who fight the good fight for their members and the community that they provide services to. <laughs> but I just gotta say, some US labor officials, like the heads of the AFL-CIO, take their repair person job far too seriously. <laughs> <laughs> they extend it to include protecting the profit system from any serious challenges. When workers' standard of living came under fierce attack after the financial crisis in 2008, AFL-CIO leaders should have been breaking with the pro-corporate Democrats and leading an all-out fight to defend the working class. And instead, they did all they could to keep a lid on any potential resistance by workers. I mean, what kind of resistance is that? What would Joe Hill say about this behavior? <laughs> He would not like it, and neither do we. <laughs> Another thing that gives me heartburn <laughs> is when union leaders go on and on about restoring the middle class. Yes, yes, yes. I hear it. I just feel the heartburn. 
This implies that it is okay if there is a lower class. <laughs> and it shows an orientation to a privileged layer of better paid workers. But really, in the era of low wage capitalism, labor should fight for all workers, including poor folks and the unorganized. <laughs> there is no middle here. Those who prattle on about the middle class are avoiding the term working class. They are skirting their responsibility to organize workers to exercise their power as a class. You know, like with general strikes and stuff. <laughs> but unions don't have to be like this. They are, after all, workers' organizations, and they can fight if rank and file members are in control of them. Many FSP members have organized union caucuses that push for more militancy and union democracy. Several comrades will be describing those efforts on a panel on Monday here. So, it, it really looks like the reformists are ill-equipped to defend workers or to protect the previous gains of social movements like abortion rights and affirmative action. So FSP can step into the breach. A good way to do this is by initiating united fronts. These are democratic organizations that include various political tendencies but have working class leadership. United fronts are crucial for defending the working class. They can mobilize workers for critical battles, like defending social services, building resistance to the national security state and its attacks on civil liberties, or stopping environmental destruction. As we work with the, with the reformists in these united fronts, we can distinguish ourselves. Rank and file activists with C, uh, we socialist feminists, as the ones with the best ideas and analysis, the ones who fight with the most resolve. In the process, we can win workers away from reformism and draw them towards a revolutionary perspective. And that process is one way FSB can carry out its main task, building that much needed revolutionary party. Another crucial way to build such a party on an international level is through continuing to collaborate with our comrades that Amy introduced from Mexico, Costa Rica, and the Dominican Republic and to further develop the Committee for a Revolutionary International Regroupment. And as Amy also said, I really do urge you to uh, go to that um, forum tonight, uh, One Hemisphere Undivided, where they'll be um, talking about that effort. A strong international, like the one that emerged from the Russian Revolution, could play a vital role in helping rebellions like the Arab Spring. What if Egyptian rebels had the support to construct a revolutionary party? A party that could transcend sectarian divisions and unite the movement around a radical program that would really end poverty and oppression for men and women alike. This is what could have kept the military from coming to power by because it would have continued the revolution moving forward. Yeah. FSP has long sought opportunities to revive Trotsky, Trotsky's International, and we are thrilled to find parties with whom we have enough common ground to move forward. Yeah. Uh, Amy used the word daunting several times earlier, and you do it might think that convincing a whole a lot of workers, like the majority, to take the road of revolution is a pretty big task. But let's remember, the bosses, with their ever worsening exploitation and their endless wars, do a lot of the convincing for us. It might help to be a little like the delegates to the founding convention of the industrial workers of the world. James P. Cannon described them as stiff-necked irreconcilables at war with capitalist society. <laughs> Doesn't that sound like a good shop steward? Anyway. <laughs> I can see a lot of stiffening necks out there. In the 
Now, to my FSP comrades here today, I can say that it is not because of a lumpy hotel mattress. <laughs> no, it is because you carry on an organization founded by women who stood up to bigotry on the job and in the streets, housing projects, and everywhere else. Women who stood up to Neanderthal leftists who scoffed at the idea of women leaders. Women who, along with like-minded men, forged a socialist feminist program that looks to the leadership of the most oppressed, who will be the best fighters. And I think that all of us here realize that it is time to, and probably you've already been, it is certainly time to be at war with the prophet Christ lunatics who inflict misery and ecological destruction. So I'll close and I'll just look forward to your comments and ideas about how together we can win a better world for workers and save our one, only, and beautiful planet. Thank you.